and we are live. Good afternoon, everyone. Are the clerks good to go? We're good to go, Mr. Chair. Super. Well, why don't I call this emergency advisory committee meeting to order for May the 6th and uh, recognize we're having today's meeting on traditional Treaty 6 territory and uh, Métis Nation Zone 4, and um, I'll roll call so we can get right into the business. Um, Councillor, uh, should we start? Councillor Nickel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon, how are you? Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. Councillor Walters. Hello, sir. Howdy, Councillor Banga. Good to see you well. That's your call. Uh, Councillor Carmel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Katerina. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Zadig. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Essinger. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Hamilton. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Henderson. Hello. Hello, Councillor Knack. Councillor Knack. Well, that is a first. <laughs> That's very odd. Councillor McKean? Yeah, I'm here and I could see Councillor Knack waving, so. Uh oh, okay, so he's got a sound issue. He is online. We will need to hear from him. Uh, so, uh, was about to give me just a, a, pardon me? I was about to call the police. <laughs> so uh, that'll give me just a moment while we he can reboot himself to uh, just note uh, for those following along that we have transitioned to about as virtual as we can get um, out of an abundance of caution given the COVID-19 situation, the public health risks. And so for occupational health and safety reasons for city employees and members of council, um, we are uh, everyone but the clerks are remote. The clerks are still in chambers running the meeting, but in order to support uh, distancing, um, and I think Andre will reinforce this and, and credit to him for the suggestion uh, that um, we were already in compliance with the rules, and but there's nothing wrong with exceeding compliance with the rules, uh, which is what we're doing here out of an abundance of caution, given the seriousness of the situation. Um, and so I think it is an opportunity to lead by example, to take every precaution possible, uh, which is what City Council is doing here while still maintaining continuity of government and the ability to be briefed and make decisions. So uh, then just also final note to bear with us um, as running these entirely virtually is a little bit more challenging <laughs> than doing it in person. So bear with us if we have any technical or procedural challenges, but uh, it's a committee meeting. So hopefully it'll be smooth. Um, I do need a motion to adopt today's agenda. Councilor, Mr. Mayor, can I test my audio? Am I yes. here now? I got, there we go, we're in. Oh, I was scared I was going to miss a vote. <laughs> Next, oh. direct. We're not going to and miss a I'm vote. happy to move the agenda for today's uh, emergency advisory committee meeting. Uh, and I don't need a secondary committee. So, so with full attendance, uh, please vote on the adoption of today's agenda. Yes, Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Pedro. Uh, Councillor Paquette, thank you. I'm also yet. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. And uh, Mr. Mayor, yours is the only vote we haven't received yet. My, my token has expired. Um, uh, so in the meantime, yes. Thank you. We have all the votes. Display the vote, please. Unanimous. Um, Councillor Knack, with the minutes. 
Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'll move the adoption of the minutes from the April 7th, 2021 Emergency Advisory Committee meeting. Thank you. Any questions, concerns, errors, or omissions with the minutes? Seeing none, then uh, I think we'll just take consent on these ones then if there's no objection to approving the minutes. Not hearing any, then we'll deem those approved. Uh, so let's dive right into the business. The reason we're here, administration's uh, presentation on the latest. <coughs> Thank you, Your Worship and Councillors. Uh, I'm joining you remotely today as a mayor indicated. Uh, also joining us remotely are members of the executive leadership team, Nicole Poirier, our newly appointed chair of the COVID-19 recovery advisory team, and Dr. Chris Sikora, the chief medical officer of the Edmonton Health Zone. We have adjusted council meetings, committee meetings, and public hearings. Till fur further notice, only the chair or vice chair of a meeting and only the staff of the city clerk supporting the meeting will be in count council chambers. This change ensures the fewest number of people in the room and exceeds the spirit of the provincial requirements. Today's update looks at our current situation. Since our last meeting, we've had uh, several movement in several key areas. And if we could switch to the next slide. Firstly, the vaccination rollout is moving forward and the number of cases is growing. These two factors continue to work against each other. The caseload numbers are cause for concern and the provinces introduce new restrictions. On the other hand, the growing number of vaccinations is cause for optimism. We will review current actions which consider both of these competing trends and prov uh, provide an overview of the impact of the recently announced restrictions on the city. For more than a year, we have been relying on Edmontonians to be vigilant about practicing ba basic public health measures, physical distancing, mask wearing, frequent hand sanitizing and minimal exposure to people outside their households. We have also encouraged Edmontonians to consider getting vaccinated when they are eligible. Now we need Edmontonians to be vigilant about following, uh, following the new restrictions. We recognize that people want to connect with each other and that they are growing impatient with these measures, but we cannot get to recovery until the spread of the disease goes down. In short, we all need to stay on the course of public health measures so that we can keep limited programming in place and so we can plan for recovery in the future. Next slide. Here are the updates on the recent case numbers. Case numbers and hospitalizations are rising as you can see and the recent provincial restrictions announced were driven by these rising case counts and this specific data. I'm now going to ask Dr. Sikora to provide some additional insight into these numbers and to discuss, and to discuss the next few slides. Well, thank you very much, Andre. Can we get to the, the next slide, please? Is my audio is my audio okay? Okay, could we get? Oh, there we go. So, what we'll provide over the next couple of slides is really an epidemiology update. So, uh, an update on the number of cases, a little bit about the demographics, uh, and a little bit about uh, other hospitalizations and factors within the Edmonton zone. So this is our, our epi curve or epidemiologic curve over uh, the last year within the Edmonton zone. So we see that large spike in the middle it is our wave two over the, over the November to January time period. On the far right hand side, uh, screen left is where we are at right now. Uh, we see these, this, these rising cases within the Edmonton zone. And um, I'm not sure if we're still rising or if we're plateauing or if we're starting to come down. Um, so which does further, I think, highlight the, the persistence all of us have around uh, needing to maintain our restrictions. Uh, our next slide. If we look at the total number of, of testing and testing again mirrors what that case curve looks like. Uh, so our testing volumes are again coming up, which is good. Um, people are doing what, what needs to be done. If you have symptoms, you are to go get tested at one of the numerous sites uh, where, where testing can occur. Uh, we're, we're getting good turnaround times in terms of that test reporting. People often have the, the text message set up to be able to receive their test results automatically, which is a really, I think, a very major innovation over the past year. And our contact tracers can get started to, to work on uh, where, where individuals were and to hopefully with our goal being to identify and prevent uh, any secondary cases. Our next slide. If we look at hospitalization specifically over the Edmonton zone, uh, and again, we see that 
that peak or those peaks in the middle. Um, that was our wave two. Uh, we're in this, this, thir this third wave on the far right hand side of the screen with, uh, at the beginning of May. And, and again, I'm not sure if that's a plateau or if that is possibly keeping uh, rising. And again, just looking at a day, to day per day numbers uh, between the, the, the preparation of these slides and, and the most recent data on the Alberta Health website, we still have 230 hospitalizations in the, in the zone and 54 individuals in ICU. So exceptionally concerning and, and ex ex exceptionally busy within our hospital, our hospital, our hospital environments. So we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, we look at demographics. Uh, our, our deaths, again, primarily have been in that, that 80 plus uh, age group, uh, followed uh, closely by our 70 to 80, and then by the 60 and 70. With the increased numbers of, of cases, and uh, we do see that average age of case starting to, to come down, uh, whereas it was in the, the high 30s uh, in, in, in last year, we're in the, the low 30s now. So we are seeing uh, much more case, much many more cases in that 20 to 30 and 30 to 40 age category. And that does correspond with our hospitalizations, ICU, uh, ICU uh, hospitalizations as well. Our next slide. So just to reinforce when we do get any, of, any new case, our contact tracers get to work on them. and contact each each of those individuals and explore well where were you what were you doing what do you, where do you think you may have actually identified this case just really start to tie together some of those threads around well, did you get acquire your covid-19 infection while at work in a community environment a school a restaurant and sometimes we see patterns arise where there there's action that can be undertaken to help prevent help investigate uh, is one, but also secondary to prevent secondary spread. And this is a, a list of common locations reported to contact tracers across the Edmonton zone, and it's an alphabetical list. So don't, don't think that this is, this is ranked from top, from highest to lowest. This just happens to be alphabetical. Um, uh, one of the things that I will highlight is that most of the cases are actually obtained within household environments themselves. Uh, we spread easily because that's where we are most of the time. Our loved ones, family members at home do spread to each other very, very, very efficiently. So that we always do work within other environments such as healthcare settings, uh, restaurants, schools, uh, work camps as, as appropriate to be able to help prevent spread and make sure those policies and procedures that each, each of these entities have in place are appropriate from a screening perspective, a hygiene perspective, cleaning perspective, and then reporting perspective as well. Um, our next slide. In terms of vaccines, Andre, was this one for, for me to do as well? Uh, I think it was, yes, Chris, but... Okay, okay, ha happy to, happy to. Oh, sorry, no, I think it was me, sorry. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Chris, very much. Really appreciate uh, the explanation of these slides, but also your sort of day-to-day, hour-to-hour, and sometimes minute-to-minute -minute support of what we're trying to do here at the city. So thank you very much for your work. So on vaccinations, uh, more than 595,000 residents in the Edmonton zone, or 33% of the population, have received their first shot, and more than 100,000 people have been fully vaccinated. This is what I would call steady progress. We continue to encourage all Edmontonians to get vaccinated as soon as they are eligible. Edmonton zone currently has seven regular immunization clinics that, can, that together can administer about 8,000 doses of vaccine a day and are running seven days a week. Appointments are currently available. The Expo Center is Edmonton's rapid flow clinic and safely accommodates immunizing large volumes of people in a short period of time when vaccine supply allows. As of April 30th, more than 30,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine have been administered at the Expo location using all of the, allow the allotted doses at that location. Immunizations at Expo will, will pause and restart throughout the next several weeks, depending on vaccine supply, and Expo is currently open for appointments only. As a result of the recent Health Canada announcement regarding the Pfizer vaccine, all Albertans aged 12 and up will now be eligible to receive a vaccine. Those 30 and over are able to book now, and anyone between the ages of 12 and 29 can begin booking on Monday, May 10th. Next slide. The city's compliance officers monitor face mask usage, recreation centers, malls, businesses, 
and religious centers, as well as outdoor gatherings in parks, sports field, dog off leash areas, uh, and everywhere else. They have been on duty seven days a week, and our compliance is strong for people observed in businesses at 98% compliance, and for those businesses that have been inspected at 99.7% compliance. Businesses are ensuring that patrons' count, uh, counts are maintained and that patrons are complying with face covering directions, and we thank them for their vigilance. Patrols in public spaces, transit locations, bus stops, LRTs have been slightly lower face uh, covering compliance, but still at 95%, rates are still very high. Complaints about mask wearing have decreased, but complaints about social distancing or physical distancing have increased. Looking ahead, compliance with distancing requirements at off-leash dog parks, basketball courts, tennis courts will be monitored because of this. Enforcement efforts by peace officers to support the work of AHS inspectors and EPS are being renewed as part of the health, safety and compliance team. The city's municipal enforcement officers will continue to monitor businesses, worship centers, malls and outdoor areas, while the public safety compliance team will monitor closure of establishments uh, with uh, liquor licenses. Next slide. Although COVID case numbers have risen with, within the larger population, the homeless community has had less than a handful of cases at any given time since February. To support vaccination efforts for shelters, uh, shelter users, Boyle, Macaulay, Health Centre and AHS have been offering a mobile vaccination centre at shelters and day drop-in locations. To date, approximately 600 individuals have received their first vaccine dose. The spectrum at the Edmonton Exhibition Lands is expected to open today, with Commonwealth Stadium no longer serving as a shelter location. And the larger 24 and 7 temporary shelters have closed and homeless people have moved from larger shelters to smaller ones as earlier briefed to Council this week. The City is working with agency operators in these new locations and is in developing enhanced good neighbour commitments for each site which include bringing additional amenities and services to these areas to help uh, clean, help them be clean and safe. These good neighbour commitments will be posted on agency websites linked from the City of Edmonton website and sent directly to residents and stakeholders around each of the locations and we will monitor them as City staff. As the weather continues to get nicer and the days get longer, many vulnerable individuals will choose to sleep outdoors and during the summer months, we expect that there will be ample shelter and transitional housing spaces for those needing shelter. And you've been briefed on our encampment approach, uh, which will ensure that housing and agency outreach workers can interact directly with rough sleepers and reduce the negative impacts to individuals and the surrounding communities. Next slide. We recognize that a clean downtown is important. It conveys that people care about the city, it feels safer and it helps visitors feel welcome. That is why we're creating opportunities to safely be outside, support local businesses and artists and helping invigorate the downtown core, including the downtown vibrancy plan. In response to concerns from the Downtown Business Association about the condition of alleys, the city has cleaned and brought in mobile washrooms. Spring sweep street cleaning activities continue right across the city uh, and downtown has uh, was done in the early phase as a priority. The capital city cleanup team is hard at work and so far this year have delivered more than 7300 cleanup kits. A partnership with Boyle Street and Higher Good called Downtown Pride, Proud is employing clients in downtown cleaning efforts providing a win for both community members and the city. On Earth Day alone, they collected more than 50 bags of garbage and more than 120 needles. They have also done power washing in downtown Alberta Avenue and Strathcona. Poster panels are also being worked on. Two metal posts on Jasper Avenue have been cleaned of poster debris and graffiti, and we are piloting a new surface treatment that may make future cleanups much easier for staff. A panel at 101st and Jasper is being replaced with wayfinding signage to help the area feel more feel more welcoming. Road and sidewalk repair downtowns are prioritized. Things like repairing bricks in custom crosswalks, grinding trip hazards on cre concrete sidewalks and repairing potholes. These efforts are all part of the downtown ready to revitalize strategy. We're also supporting BIAs directly right across the city to provide services and attract people to visit their areas. 
These include the coordination, coordination of spring cl sweeping, cleaning tree grates, and removing dead vegetation. Shared streets and mobility lanes given the need for physical distancing in dense residential neighborhoods. Facilitating on-street activation through curb lane cl closures and licensing space for park activations for innovations such as the Downtown Spark, which is still underway with the Arts District Animation, Mother Tongue's Arts Installation, and Route 107, a pop-up park in the future warehouse campus location. We have made adjustments to allow for patios and public spaces like parking lots. While they may not be accessible today given the recent instruct restrictions, more than 125 locations will be ready to welcome guests when it's appropriate to do so. And so far the numbers are even higher than last year and well beyond what we would have done in a typical year as denoted by this slide. On April 29th, the provincial government announced target restrictions for hotspot communities, which included Edmonton. As of April 30th, all indoor recreation facilities were ordered closed and all indoor fitness and sports activities are prohibited. This includes indoor youth performance activities that were previously permitted and all rentals and bookings for sports organizations using gyms, arenas and pools. On May 4th, additional measures were announced that restricted outdoor recreation activities and group sizes. This has resulted in the cancellation of sports field bookings and outdoor programs offered by the city. City administration has worked closely with groups to cancel the bookings and have connected with patrons to inform them of program cancellations. These restrictions have required us to make additional difficult staffing decisions. The April 30th restrictions of indoor recreations resulted in nearly 70 colleagues being temporarily, temporarily laid off, while nearly 40 have avoided layoff by being shifted to other work to prepare for seasonal programs and services. And once again, we thank them for their agility. Although indoor and outdoor recreation programs and bookings are canceled, Edmontonians do have other recreation opportunities which allow them to remain active. Spontaneous use of parks, sports fields and courts playing services by single households continue to be allowed. Playgrounds and skate parks remain open, but we caution users to ensure they follow all the safety precautions, gathering restrictions and distancing requirements. The annual Mutart Conservatory plant sale has moved online again this year with curbside pickup, allowing citizens to continue to participate in this highly anticipated event. Administration is seeking clarity on operations of the city's golf courses, driving range and the Valley Zoo, but at this point we think they can remain open. Plans continue to be developed so that when provincial health orders allow, popular activities such as the Green Shack program, outdoor pools and the City Hall Fountain can launch safely. The ongoing uncertainty of the pandemic has taken a toll on our partner operated facilities as well. Many partners have successfully navigated the health orders to adapt and offer safe services to visitors, moving online training and coaching and in some cases even offering new online experiences. For example, the Edmonton Public Library continues to offer virtual programming, curbside pickup of books, access to digital resources, free Wi-Fi outside uh, branches, and customer support by phone, text, email, and chat. We are encouraged by the resilience of many of these partners during this pandemic and pleased that together we're able to ensure some level of recreation for Edmontonians. The TELUS World of Science closed to the public for many months has successfully moved to online learning offered to schools and individual households. And Fort Edmonton Park continues to plan for its grand reopening, which has been moved back to July 1st. In addition to the impacts of recreation services, some of the other restrictions will also have an impact on Edmontonians. The closure of outdoor patios will temporarily pause operations for those businesses participating in the city's temporary patio program. Takeout and delivery available options continue to support our local restaurant industry to the extent possible. And retail capacity has also been further decreased from 15% to 10% with curbside pickup or delivery being strongly encouraged. If individuals or organizations choose not to follow these new restrictions, they will face a double fine amount of $2,000 with a maximum possible fine of $100,000 based on the new provincial uh, restrictions. In addition, the pro in addition, the province is launching 
a multi-agency enforcement protocol to rapidly and effectively respond to those that ignore the restrictions on an ongoing basis, putting all of our hard work at risk. While new restrictions were announced this week, we are still looking forward to recovery and will continue to monitor our, way, our progress towards recovery. You will recall from the previous meeting uh, that we are monitoring a specific set of conditions to ensure our approach is balanced and timely. And we will continue to monitor the health of Edmontonians, the health of our economy and compliance rates. Since our last EAC meeting, the COVID-19 dashboard has been launched. The COVID case dial reflects the current growth in active cases, while the COVID-19 response dial depicts the overall progress made by the city. It is unlikely that progress will be linear for either, and we expect to experience some early steps forward and back between response on the left and recovery on the right. With the vaccine rollout broadly activated and new provincial restrictions introduced as a way to manage the number of cases, we hope that the COVID daily uh, dial will move quickly towards the green area. The Healthy Edmontonians dashboard tracks metrics related to epidemiology, supports provided to those experiencing homelessness, facility status and attendance levels at recreation facilities, and pedestrian and bike counts. The Healthy Economy dashboard presents activity related to travel, festivals and tourism, building and development permits, and educational institutions. I'd like to draw your attention to the development permit and building permit charts on the top right of this slide. Current permit numbers are higher now than in recent years. Development applications are continuing to come in and the city is continuing to ensure they are fairly considered. The total construction value of uh, building permits is higher than 2019 and in April was higher than last year's levels. Both are positive signals of a healthy economy recovery. The jobs they create have an immediate positive impact and the projects that bring to life the, slow, the show the long-term confidence in Edmonton's community. And finally, the Regulations and Compliance Dashboard monitors overall compliance with both the city's bylaw and the Public Health Act orders. The Regulations and Compliance Dashboard should look familiar to you. It tracks the same metrics we have been reporting to EAC, EAC and publicly each week. Bylaw compliance, the number of warnings and tickets issued. And so with that, uh, I conclude and we would be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Corbold, and thank you, Dr. Sikora, for uh, uh, joining us and, and being part of the presentation. Um, it's been really valuable to have you at uh, most of, uh, well, to have AHS at, I think, all of these meetings to have you at most of them. So thank you. I know you must be very busy right now, so we appreciate it tremendously. Uh, okay, my speaker's list starts with Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. Um, I didn't anticipate being first. Uh, I think a really big piece of news here has, uh, in the last few days, has been around um, uh, the increased enforcement. Uh, and I think in the city, we've always prided ourselves on the balance between that GBA plus lens and, and uh, uh, the relationship with law enforcement. So um, could you go into a few more details about how, um, uh, how what the relationship with uh, is between these, like into this sort of, I won't call it a task force, but it's an interagency task force essentially, um, and how you're preserving um, our own values as a community and not targeting vulnerable people. Yes, thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Um, so it really is based on the health safety compliance team, which is made up of a number of enforcement agencies that continue to triage public complaints and respond to them. And team members include Alberta Health Services, Edmonton Police Service, uh, Peace Officers and the Fire Rescue Service and Occupational Health and Safety when needed. And that team is now increasing in size and activity based on the recent provincial announcement. What I would also like to reiterate is that we're not measuring a success on compliance with number of tickets. The way to measure success on compliance is with actual compliance. And so I do reiterate that, um, you know, that's what we're looking for. And the compliance is really, really high of Edmontonians because I think, um, you know, they, they understand the situation and they're, they're doing their best uh, to do what they can. And then just to conclude, I would say that we are definitely uh, appropriately taking 
you know, a very kind and thoughtful approach from a, through a B, GBA plus lens with our vulnerable population. And I think we see that every day with all of these services in terms of how they interact with those citizens. Great, thank you. Um, uh, this is gonna go straight down into details. Um, with the closure of recreation facilities, more and more people are going to be outdoors now. And I'm getting concerns from people who live adjacent to popular outdoor spots, um, particularly popular stairs uh, in Wolf Willow, um, about how last summer we saw more compliance on the stairs. And now it, it seems like the same problem is back, that there's a, a sort of a a huge amount of people using the stairs and a lack of social distancing. So um, I, I, you know, can't believe I'm asking about policing stairs again, but um, uh, are you looking at those locations as part of your um, uh, enforcement or, or compliance measures? Yes, we are indeed, uh, Councillor. That's uh, part of the triage per, per, uh, of the public complaints it's done. And, and certainly stairs did come to our attention recently and uh, it's part of the triage system and, and will be looked at. And the other thing I would say is that uh, given the, uh, the quick pivoting businesses have had to do on the patios, we're now trying to see what we can do to support businesses to adjust what was approved for patios, which now cannot be used. Uh, but perhaps open those up a bit more so that there can be increased physical distancing in those areas and close close to them. Great, thank you. Um, those are my questions, uh, so I'll, I'll leave it to other councillors. Councillor Mack. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you all for the information. Uh, just a few more questions on enforcement. So, Mr. Corbold, when, when you give the numbers uh, and those numbers that we get in the weekly report, are those just from, I want to confirm, they're just from the City of Edmonton bylaws or things like that. Does that include EPS? Yeah, it does uh, include the entire team that's working okay. in the City of Edmonton. So as we indicated, sometimes we need to bring uh, occupational health and safety folks in as well. So it, it includes the entire joint team that is working within the city. And it's essentially that when I, when I talk about, you know, a 99% compliance, essentially every, every of all the interactions they have, of all the people they see, they actually count who's complying and not. And, and we end up with, with that figure overall. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, so I guess the other enforcement related question I have, um, you know, we've talked about in the past how there's been sort of weekly gatherings um, that sometimes just stay on the legislature grounds, which I realize is not our jurisdiction, but oftentimes they are coming off. Um, and it's a very small number of people, uh, just like we saw with, a, with an event this weekend in another part of Alberta. Um, so in the past, we've typically not tried to do enforcement until after the fact. So I guess I'm wondering two questions. One, how many tickets have we actually issued to those who have been organizing those events who have been involved? Because I know we're not doing it at the event, we're, we're doing it after the fact. So I'm wondering how we're holding those, how we have been holding them accountable. And then how are we going to now continue to hold them accountable, recognizing that it appears there's a, a more significant crackdown on, on trying to get this very, very, very small number of people to, um, to do the same thing that 99% of us are already doing. Yeah. Yeah, thank, I, I think I'll, add, I'll, I'll first try to defer to the EPS on this because most of those types of tickets, I, th I think, are coming from the EPS. So, And I don't have those yep. numbers available. So I know we have uh, an EPS rep. I'm it's sorry, Deputy, I'm not sure. Deputy Chief Hilton, I think. Is it, is yes, it? thank you, yeah. Deputy Chief. Yeah, Dean Hilton can speak to that there, Superintendent EPS here. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, it, again, I, I don't have specific numbers. I can say we haven't written a lot of tickets after the fact to organizers and coordinators. Again, our strategy has been to try to work with all the coordinators to get them on side to help us manage uh, compliance with respect to their contingents that come out. Um, we know there's been times when they go off and they'll do a walkabout off a ledge property, but um, to date our strategy has really been to try and, again, gain the compliance with them um and, and just work with them to try and and keep things in in, in hand 
Uh, as far as the legislature goes, again, we're working closely with the sheriffs. Uh, we're in touch with them again today to address the enforcement and their direction that they're getting and whatnot. So we continue to work with them on that and, and try to be consistent with respect to our approach on it. Thank you. And, and I don't want to push too much on this. I guess I'm just curious when, at what point do you start taking that next step? Um, you know, this has been going on now for eight months, I guess, I think, for some of these sort of weekly gatherings. And um, it, it is rather exhausting, I think, for, again, the 99% the of Edmontonians who are who are doing what we can, who are making incredible sacrifices, recognizing that their businesses are closed down. And then when they see this, it, it, it I think it wears on a lot of, well, I'll speak for myself, it wears even on me uh, seeing that. And, and so I'm wondering, at what point do we try to, you know, work together and and see if they'll they'll join, you know, comply versus saying, okay, you know, like we, we saw with Grace Life Church in different areas, and say it's time, it, it, we can't keep allowing this. I, I think, Councillor, that essentially has been done and done with the changes the province has made this week, with an increase in fines and uh, an increase focused on enforcement. I think. That's a clear signal to me that uh, they are taking a next step, which is rightly where it should be in, you know, from a jurisdictional perspective. And, and I know that, you know, that step is being coordinated with uh, the EPS uh, and, right. and our folks as well. So it, okay. it wasn't a surprise. There was some discussions about that step and uh, okay. I think we're taking it now. Oh, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, maybe one last question for this round. Um, you mentioned just talking about the downtown and, and maybe since we've got uh, Mr. Uh, Superintendent Hilton here, just wondering your perspective on on uh, crime and safety in the downtown. Uh, I think there's sometimes a lot of conversation about it, but I'm wondering if the numbers actually are showing there's a significant spike or if it's steady or we're seeing differences. Do you have any information on that? Uh, Deputy Murphy, can I defer that one to you? Oh. Sorry, Councillor, I'm just in the middle of something else here. Can you just repeat your question for me? I apologize uh, for that. I'll, I'm out of time. I'll come back around. Sorry, I just don't want to abuse my time here. Thank you, though. Thank you, Councillor Mack. Councillor Henderson. Um, yeah, I'm curious just to follow up a little bit on Councillor Hamilton's questions. And, and I think, uh, Mr. Colbert, something you mentioned, which is we're getting more concerns about the social distancing than the masks at this point. And, uh, and I... I'm wondering if this is completely anecdotal, and maybe it's not a worry, but it does seem to me, I think a lot of messages, messaging has been around the social distancing outdoors or the safety of outdoors as opposed to indoors. And it feels like we've let a lot of people letting their guards down around that social distancing piece outdoors. And I'm wondering if that's something we need to keep an eye on, if there's a messaging piece we need to put back out. Or maybe if the risk is is relatively low, something we need to worry about less. Um, so I don't know, uh, you know, Dr. Skor or Mr. Cobalt, I don't know which one is best to answer that, but I thought I'd throw it out. I'm curious. Yeah, well, maybe I'll start, Councillor, by by saying uh, absolutely, and and it's exactly, you know, I think I tried certainly to reflect it in my, in my remarks today that this is a dynamic situation, and based on the data. Uh, we need to certainly ramp up our, our physical distancing reminders and education and sort of public service announcements on physical distancing. And I think we're, it's also a reflection of the weather is nice and people are getting outside and, um, you know, it, it may not be as front of mind than when you're walking through a grocery store, for example, where there's signage everywhere and, and stickers on the floor and things like that. So based on that data, uh, we are going to ramp that up. And, we, and I think you're right. We absolutely need to. So. Yeah, I, I worry a bit that we sent accidentally sent a message that it's relatively safe, um, and it is rel it is safer, but we that may have acted you know that we may have actually you know that complacency may come from a message that we've accidentally sent. So, I, Dr. I, Scarra, I, I, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't think there was an accidental message. I just think it's dynamic and and things change, and and it still is much safer to be outside. Absolutely, than to be yeah. inside. But it's even safer if you're outside and social distancing. But sorry, uh, Dr. Sakura, you may want to add something. 
Yeah, I think it does represent an opportunity to reinforce the messages around physical distancing, around hand hygiene, around uh, all the other activities that we have undertaken over the past 12 months to, to protect one another. Um, the rather sharp increase in cases in the past several weeks does does serve as, I guess, fire fire to, to reinforce that. So, um, I mean, if, if we are able to, to help uh, remind individuals that when you are outdoors, physical distancing is still appropriate, uh, Alberta Health uh, promoted um, uh, some, some maximum group sizes and then cohort numbers with that. Um, and anytime we do have these changes in direction as, as a result of, of increased case numbers, uh, we, we do always have to revisit what that public messaging is. So I'll, I, th I think I'll, I'll, I'll take that as ex exceptionally good feedback that we do have to remind the uh, our public and be good communicators when these things do change. Yeah, I think particularly in the outdoors. I'm, the, another thing I was curious about, and um, just to see if there's any lessons learned from that, was that the numbers have been, and it's a good news story, but the numbers have been so low in the homeless community because this time last year we were terrified if it got into that community it was going to spread, spread like wildfire. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if there's any lessons. You know, it may be that we've done a really good job. It may be that something else is going on there. And I'm wondering if there's any if there's any learning from that that is useful um, to translate out into our larger response. Probably a question to you, Dr. Sakara. I, I think when, when we look at places where we have seen success, um, it, that, that success is, is based on a number of different factors. Um, one is our, our investigation mechanisms, our management mechanisms, our outbreak control mechanisms, and then the prevention mechanisms. So vaccines work. And uh, we've been able to, to get over uh, just over a thousand doses in our, our underhoused, uh, unsta unstably housed population across Edmonton. Uh, so we, we were very strict about following the, the rules of 2A, uh, categories 2A and 2B. If you're eligible, by all means, we'll get you in, we'll get you immunized and protected, or at least on the way to being protected. Uh, I think all of our all of our teams across Alberta have done a, a very good job around the screening, around the hand hygiene. Uh, our, our populations have been very uh, invested in staying healthy and staying safe. Uh, and our teams that help manage those those facilities themselves are very good and adept at outbreak management, outbreak control, getting people into uh, medically uh, supervised environments to be able to monitor them while they maintain their isolation period. That that happens, and uh, it happens very easily um, to to everyone to the best of everyone's ability. Uh, so, you know, it's it's a work in progress. We still have a lot of work to do over over the upcoming weeks to months. Uh, we're constantly watching and are ever vigilant. We want to protect more people. Uh, we see the expansion of uh, the age eligibility criteria for, for immunization. So we, we do encourage everyone to be immunized when your turn comes available. And that turn, it's, it's almost every adult now. Um, 30, 30 plus, it's going to be 12 plus on Monday. Um, but we still have to remain very vigilant. Right, Can I would just quickly add okay. that um, I, I think part of the counter has been rules. Uh, the shelters that have been operating have been operating on very clear rules and the vulnerable people using those shelters have been following the rules and we really appreciate that, that kind of, uh, you know, citizenship. Great. Thanks. Councillor Ratzinger. Thank you. Um, Similar to Councillor Naka, I'm worried about the gatherings for anti-maskers. Uh, I understand there was a rally on Saturday at 97th Street and 118 Avenue, uh, about 100 people, and many of the residents very nervous, was loud. Um, I understand there was five police there, and when people called the non-emergency line, they were told they had a permit so the police could do nothing. Um, do we give out permits? Who gives out permits? Sorry, I'm, I don't have the answer to that question. Um, Andre, perhaps I can take that one. Thank you. Um, so the Civic Events and Festivals Office will work with groups who are looking to uh, who, are, who request permits. However, at this time, uh, we are not issuing any permits to any protest rally, 
uh, as they do not comply with the public health measures. So what the Civic Events and Festivals Office does is that we work closely with the EPS liaison officer, who, as, doc, uh, as uh, Dean Hilton uh, indicated, uh, try to connect with these protests and rallies in advance to gain compliance. Uh, and in the event they're not able to gain compliance, EPS then takes the lead on um, managing the rally protest march, et cetera, on the day. But no protests and rallies at this time are being issued permits by the city of Edmonton. So on Saturday, they wouldn't have had a permit. They did not have a permit for that event. Because that's what the, the community was told. So I'm hoping with additional enforcement, we're able to deal with that because the community, I was getting emails very concerned about what was happening. And we have committed to work with our EPS communications colleagues to ensure that all of the officers on site are aware that there is no permit issued. All right. Thank you. I think we missed that one. Um, now I'm going to switch to a totally different direction. Um, many Edmontonians appreciate that we have off-leash areas. Um, and I know in Lauderdale, I'm getting complaints about... Uh, the smell of the off-leash uh, park. Um, some attribute it to us no longer providing the doggy bags. Um, and we stopped doing that last year because of potential virus uh, transmission. Um, I'm not sure if we're still in that place or we're going to look at that. I'm not aware. Uh, is anyone from City Operations? Uh, Phil, are you able to respond to that? Councillor Esslinger, it's uh, Brian Simpson here. You're, you're right, the bags were uh, discontinued. Two pieces to that. One was the transmission potential around the virus, and the other piece was a budget consideration of approximately $80,000 for that process. Um, we're still dealing with the virus process, so that is still in play, but we are looking at bringing that back at some point, but potentially even if there's an opportunity for corporate sponsorship to offset the costs of that program. But at this point in time, we do not have those bags available for the public. Um, so the concern is that the people are just letting it happen. And so there's a lot of smell at the off-leash parks. Do we do anything about that? I think part of this would be an education component. Uh, if there's a particular park, I can have the team take a look and just see if there's a way that we might be able to facilitate cleaning up the area. Uh, Lauderdale Park. Okay, thank you. And the last one I have is really just a comment. I had received some communication from some seniors eager to have the opening of Senior Century. They said, we've had our vaccinations, both of them. When do we get to go? and meet again. Uh, I know we can't do that right now, but is that on uh, discussion for the future? Uh, Councillor Leslie interrupts me there. Uh, absolutely, absolutely it is. Um, when the province relaxes its requirements, um, the senior centres will be scoped into, into, into the reopening plan. So as soon as we're allowed to, that will be, that will proceed. Okay, thank you very much. That's all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Essinger, Councillor Branga. Thank you. Uh, question for you, uh, Dr. Sikora. Um, uh, yeah, I, I know we are uh, getting increased number of uh, cases to date. I mean, that's obvious. Could you be able to tell me, uh, we have had probably enough time and enough data to analyze, uh, see if, uh, is there any data available on people getting uh, tested positive twice or uh, more than twice in a row. What I mean is uh, if you get tested once, you cure, get cured and then you test it uh, again and uh, you're positive again. That, that, that's a good question, Councillor Banga. Um, uh, So the, 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 the most common tests that we use in Alberta are, are, are viral-based tests that actually detect the viral material itself, and they're exceptionally sensitive. Uh, so when an individual 
uh, is exposed to COVID-19, uh, they, they would commonly develop an infection. Uh, and when, when they get that brush that gets stuck up the nose, it gets little bits of the viral material in our lab is able to identify the presence of the virus there. So when somebody recovers, um, there, there may for a time period uh, re remain uh, viral debris or viral material still in, in the back of the nose. And our tests are so sensitive that those tests may persist to be positive for some time afterwards, uh, typically for, for weeks, sometimes months afterwards. So that when people in the months after recovering for COVID, if those individuals do go for testing, and if the test comes back positive in the months after being recovered from COVID, that positive or that new positive test after recovery has to be carefully has to be carefully interpreted. Um, it has to be interpreted in the context of has that person had a repeat exposure? Um, is has the new exposure likely uh, to have been uh, as a result of a variant of concern? Sometimes, uh, I guess back in November, December, we had more of the typical wild type uh, COVID nineteen or the the usual type, and now we have uh, we have uh, uh, more of the variants of concern. So that second test months after a recovery has to be put into context of is this a new infection, or is this sometimes, um, uh, as we sometimes can see, is this related to the original infection just with viral debris? Sometimes the lab can help sift that out. Sometimes it has to get sifted out as a result of the, 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 the contact tracing and, and investigation, as in all well, somebody new in your household is a brand new case, therefore you with symptoms have to be assessed. We always track with a person, do you have more symptoms that would make us suspicious that this is a, a second case or a reinfection? Uh, so we have to have to put that into, into context for the individual. And we do that each and every time for the individual. Sometimes it is a bit of a, a judgment call, uh, but we do follow with best evidence, best available evidence, because we know that anytime somebody has COVID-19 as, uh, as an illness, it does cause limitations in what they can and cannot do. So we, each of those are almost on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Hopefully that helps a bit. Uh, yeah, sure it does. Uh, anyway, uh, one more question for you again is, uh, uh, is there any data available that proves uh, that people who are vaccinated uh, are not going to get it again or uh, or they're going to get it again? So what we know from our immunization data and our, our it, it, and again is going to be a very evolving field. Uh, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines that we do have commonly available and including Astra, AstraZeneca are very good at preventing illness and severe, severe illness. So better than 90% effective at preventing hospitalization and, and, and very, very bad outcomes. There still is a lot of uh, literature yet to be crafted around uh, what happens around an individual's transmissibility. So while you might not get severe illness, are you still communicable? Or are, are you and can you still be a risk to others if you are exposed to, to COVID-19? Um, so that, that still is emerging evidence. Uh, other, other countries, US and, and some of our European counterparts have crafted policy documents to help support what eased restrictions may be for individuals who have had two doses of or two appropriately spaced dose of vaccine. Uh, we're, we're still working on that within the Canadian and certainly the Alberta context, um, but it's still an evolving field. Uh, vaccines work. They're very good at preventing. Um, just we're, we're still working through some of the processes of, of what it means for, for individual mobility. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Banga. Councillor Katerina. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Corbo, you mentioned that uh, the spectrum uh, uh, opened this morning. That's correct. 
uh, this evening, this afternoon, I believe, this it's evening. Open. Yes, it's today open. for sure. Okay. Yeah. So uh, in regards to that, uh, the actual game plan uh, and I guess the, the concern uh, we talked about encampments and given its location uh, right next to Borden Park, uh, a major park, that the two could go hand in hand. So has there been any consideration or any thought about uh, uh, access and egress uh, uh, to the spectrum? You, you have uh, uh, two other uh, entrances uh, uh, that would not be near Borden Park whatsoever. No egress or no access. Uh, have you considered uh, uh, limiting that access from that from the south side entrance and using the east off Gretzky or using the north off 118th? Yeah, I, I have not from from a level of detail, but I'll, I'll see if uh, Mr. Smythe is able to add clarity on that. Okay. Uh, the only thing I can, I think the. Uh, They've been working on an access and egress plan, Councillor, and they haven't landed on how that's going to look. But at this point, you're right. I believe it's to the to the south. Um, as, well, as, yeah, the, that's the, the piece. Sorry, quickly, very quickly. The other piece that they're scoping in is is a Hope Mission have their own their own their own uh, their own van to transport people between uh, the Spectrum and their downtown facility. So that should relieve some of those um, pressure points. The well, idea, so, yeah, right. given this is, you know, I mean, 24 uh, seven, it's going to be around the clock. And uh, I think the easiest way uh, for this to happen is that there's no access or egress from the south side of the building. Uh, they can be bussed in, they can be banned in. And that was going to be another question. How, how are the majority of people actually getting there? And uh, uh, there's perfect good access uh, from the east and the north. And again, uh, with no uh, egress outside uh, to Borden Park, uh, I think would be the most prudent way to go. There's an infield there that outside activities could be contained within, uh, within the site uh, uh, very, very easily without conflict with you know, people's rights and whatever. They, there's uh, a perfectly good park uh, right in the infield uh, uh, that could accommodate outside use uh, if that was required. We'll take a hard look at that, Councillor, and we will. And see any, other point, any other additional point, Councillor, is we certainly have increased our peace officer presence on that south side, so they will be, they will be able to monitor that, and and the washroom in the park as well will will also be staffed. Well, again, so what what would be uh, uh, what would be the issue if there was no access or egress from the south side? Like, is, is there something that I don't know about that uh, we're creating some sort of uh, legal issue or humanitarian issue or, uh, I mean, there's a perfectly good park inside uh, uh, the grounds uh, versus the outside because peace officers are not going to uh, stop people from going into Board Park. And, uh, and, and that's the, my concern is that uh, uh, the encampments will start to set up right there outside the door. Certainly, as the city manager says, we'll take a hard look at that with uh, with with the operator as well. Okay, please. I mean, if if it doesn't conflict with any, you know, humanitarian or, or legal uh, perspective, uh, that would be my suggestion. Please uh, uh, don't use the south side of the building. Uh, use north and east if uh, for egress and the access to it. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Paquette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've been getting feeling a lot of questions from the public, and uh, maybe the best thing to do is get the answer in an official fashion. But uh, they're asking, why isn't this state, like, given that uh, we have the highest rates of, uh, of uh, COVID transmission in North America, in United States and Canada? Um, why is the city not enacting a state of local emergency? And my understanding is that the actual powers we derive from such a declaration uh, would not really have an impact on what is going on today, and that this is generally in the hands of the provincial government. And uh, I'm just wondering if you can clarify that so that we can put the question sort of to rest. Yeah, that, that's a uh, very uh, accurate uh, Councillor, uh, I've I've recently, and we always every time there's a change of data or change in restriction, we take a look at the state of local emergency 
and we analyze if that would provide us any powers that we don't have today to do what we think we need to do. And I can absolutely verify that in the last couple of weeks, we've looked at it twice. There's nothing that a declaring a state of local emergency would do to give us more powers. And I think you're quite right. A lot of the, the things are, and, and really, to be honest, the most powerful um, orders are the health orders that come from uh, health and AHS. Uh, in terms to, to enforce and that, and that is being done right now. So the bottom line is there's there's we there's not a new power that would would uh, help the city do anything if we just stated or if we declared a state of local emergency and we review that every week or so just to make sure. Yeah, thank you. That was my understanding as well. I read it over many times and I could not find anything. So uh, the next question is um, so Folks are a little bit obviously fatigued uh, with the warm weather they're getting out, uh, with uh, a lot of people getting their first vaccination. Um, there's a lot of confidence around in, in people that things are going to be okay. Now, I remember maybe uh, two months ago, we talked about uh, the emergence of B117 and what that would mean for our numbers. And that actually was borne out, but at the time, the message to the public was that, you know what, what we're doing right now is going to work. Uh, you know, while it's possible that we see an uptick in cases, uh, we feel confident that the current health measures are sufficient, but it turns out they weren't. Or maybe if everyone actually um, followed them, they would be. But given that we know that there is that variable, that people actually will not independently follow a lot of these things, some people, um, what is our what's our communication uh, and maybe Dr. Sikori your best uh, to answer this what's our communication to the public and our cross communication from municipality to provincial government about the need to um, take into account these variables and to actually plan accordingly instead of sort of planning uh, according to what might look good on paper because that is not has not been borne out uh, in real life You know, I th I th thank you very much, Councillor Paquette. I think that, that's a fair question. Um, one of the one of the consistent uh, things in this is that we we are and continue to be in a race uh, between variants, and on the other side of that is our immunization program themselves. Uh, emergence of variants was was something that was expected, uh, and now I, I believe across Alberta we have about sixty percent of our new cases are variants identified. And variants are a whole cluster of, of different of diff different uh, strains that have increased transmissibility, and in some cases, increased mortality. We are in a race and continue to be in a race. And on the on our healthcare provision side, uh, we're we're doing our best to maintain healthcare service delivery uh, in, in in light of those increasing increasing case numbers themselves, uh, increasing hospitalizations and ICU uh, utilization. Um, what is what is different from this in this wave uh, to the to our wave two is uh, we we have been able to protect our our our, our congregate living elderly population. Uh, so we're seeing exceptionally low numbers of cases in those environments uh, because of immunization and because of controls that have been in place. And that's, those are good things overall, but it does highlight and show that we are capable of doing those protection and those protective works. Around our, our general public, um, we, we, we do, of, of course, implore everyone to follow our, our, the direction as presented by our colleagues at Alberta Health and the government of Alberta, because those are the things that are going to be instrumental in helping to reduce case numbers and reduce transmission events overall. Not everyone does follow, and that's, that's exceptionally unfortunate. We, we do our best uh, within our households, within our communities, within our, our businesses to be able to, to follow those those things that do keep each other and keep keep each other and keep one another safe. And uh, continue to work with organizations, community groups, municipalities, uh, businesses, uh, unions, and employers to be able to reinforce that we're in this a while longer yet. Uh, we do see that light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, 
which is our immunization immunization provision across Alberta uh, with the ever expanding age eligibility. That's that's a good thing overall. Um, we're just asking everyone to hold on for a little while longer and, and do what's best to, to help stop transmission. Thank you for that. For some of my family, the race was lost even when they followed all the uh, rules. So yeah. maybe not the best answer for folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm done. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor McKean. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, we're going to have a unique problem emerging in Edmonton over coming weeks that Calgary won't have, and that is NHL playoffs. And a lot of informal gatherings, maybe hundreds of them in the city. And I just wonder, Mr. Corbold, um, and maybe even Ms. Owen, do you think it would be worthwhile to put out as maybe work with the Oilers as a partner to get some specific communications out about if you're going to gather to watch the Oilers, here's how to do it safely. I think that makes a lot of sense, Councillor, and uh, we'll take that away uh, for sure. And Catherine, I don't know if you want to add anything. That's a very good idea and we'll action it. It's not going to be a lot of fun for fans, the message we put out, but we'll, uh, we will help them stay safe. Yeah, I think the question would be if you did it in your backyard, you probably couldn't do it safely in your rumpus room, but you might be able to do it safely in your backyard. And that's where um, I wanted to ask, uh, Chris, um, do we, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm absolutely clear on this. Should we be wearing masks all the time, even when we're outside? It, it, it can't hurt um, and, and maybe, maybe beneficial. Uh, Alberta Health did did release uh, in, under the more stricter the stricter criteria some guidance on outdoor events themselves. I, I believe it's a maximum of five with two households. Um, it's it's available on on their their Alberta.ca COVID website. Uh, so it does it does restrict numbers and capacity of a fair bit best to watch the playoffs in your own in your own household in, in your own basement and if if necessary open a zoom session and keep the mic open yeah or or teach people how to drink a beer with a mask on um the other uh it, it, i think it was uh, deputy chief murphy is that you on the call yes counselor yeah hi um counselor knack had brought this up earlier but i got quite a bit of negative feedback from downtown businesses. I think it was a previous meeting that the message that got out and I, I think it was inadvertent was that downtown was this sort of lawless, a uh, danger place. And I, and I don't know if you have the data in front of you today, but it might be worthwhile getting that. I'd love to have it. Uh, Cause I suspect there's been an increase in property crime, but there probably hasn't been, I, I don't think, there's been a huge increase in in um, violence. Can you say anything about that? Thanks for the question, Councillor. Um, I can. I don't have the specific numbers in terms of violent crime or property crime downtown. What I can say is, citywide, from March to April this year, we did have a slight increase in disorder occurrences, which is can increase the perception that there's increased crime depending on what people see. So we did see an increase there. I will get you some numbers I can send to yourself and Councillor Knack through the Police Commission and in terms of uh, crime downtown. That would be really helpful. I, I think we need to broadcast the facts around that um, and how when there's natural surveillance back on the streets, people going to work, people going to restaurants, all that stuff means we'll probably see a lot of a drop in that. So uh, thanks, Al, I appreciate that. Last thing, Dr. Sakura, um, we all probably all been reading too much about COVID and the science. One of the recent pieces I read, and just out of a logistics uh, question, the suggestion was you could get one vaccine and your second one could be another one. So if you're out of Astra, could, could it be that, you know, you had a elderly folks like me get your first vaccine whenever that was a couple months ago and could like if you don't, you're not getting any more Astra, 
is the pot, could it be that we start to introduce a different type of vaccine for your second one to make sure that we can keep moving people through the line? That's a great question. We're working through exactly that to, to help craft the supporting documents that uh, would really set the, 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 the parameters around the decision making. Uh, so you, you are correct. If if they're, if you're out of the, the one product and you don't have any product available to, to get that second dose in, does it, does it mean you have a complete second series of a different product or do you have a single single dose of of, a, of an alternative? And and I'm not sure yet. We're still working through that. A lot of the, the vaccine schedules themselves are set by the national advisory committee, and then the provinces uh, pick those up and implement them. And we're just in the process of uh, cre crafting the policy documents to help support what should be done. So, yes, we'll have an answer, just not yet. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thanks a lot. Mr. Walters. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Corbo, just to confirm a couple things uh, that I think you said in your presentation. Uh, so, sports fields for all organized outdoor sports are off off the table for the foreseeable. That's correct. Thing. Okay. So, soccer, baseball, et cetera, et cetera. That's all. So, the communication to all those groups that reach out to our offices is just continue to hang tight. Nothing can happen. That's correct. Okay. Um, in terms of business supports, you know, our economic recovery grant, we just talked a little bit about that um, at committee and council. Uh, what more do you know about what the province is going to offer in terms of supports for businesses who are, you know, dealing with the yo-yo, the, the sort of ping pong of this whole thing? Uh, do we know if they communicated more to you about further business supports and are we prepared to potentially match some stuff from our own COVID recovery money or from our own budget to help our local business community? I've not seen anything specific in the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, and I know that the task force, Nicole, is not aware either. So I just don't believe there's been anything specific released by the province, but we can, uh, we may have not checked in uh, in a while. And I'll just see if Ms. McCabe wants to add anything. Councillor Walters, we haven't heard anything from the province as of yet in terms of increased business supports, uh, but we are working with the province and we have heard that from BIAs and from businesses that right. increased supports from the uh, province would be very helpful right now. So, and you know, I don't know, I don't know that I'll I'd bother with this, not bother with this, but take this initiative today. I think we should give it some thought as a, as a council. Uh, soon to maybe that's a bit of advocacy we could do you know we've been very strong in our messaging here from mayor and council about restrictions and you know i support that uh but yeah our business community is bleeding bad and and at the very least if we could you know add some voice to that to their voice as their council uh mr mayor that's probably something we should think about uh, whether we do that next week it, uh but I'll, I'll just raise that for now like i, I Maybe Andre and, or sorry, Mr. Corbo. In the meantime, if you you're able to dig around and we can get an update on that at, at some point, that that would be useful. When when are we meet? When's this committee meet next? It would probably be uh, June. Okay. But we can get an update to you before that if we can get uh, the information. So we will we will uh, endeavor to uh, have that conversation, have that specific question, and then we can update council through a memo to council. And then, uh, if we want to turn that into advocacy, that's more appropriate at a at an executive committee we, meeting yeah. or a council meeting. So oh. the week between now and when we come back, we can pick that up. We have we have exec on Monday, so I don't know if it's per, like I just feel like that urgency. You know, I've what I've heard from my constituents in the last few days is from those people who own small businesses who are just like they get it, but they're at the end of their rope. And as much as we can stand behind them, even if it is advocacy, I think. Uh, and but advocacy informed by feedback we're getting from our BIAs and our local business owners, so it'd be very, it would be something. So we could think about that in the next few days. Thanks. And That's all. The next, and the next EAC is the eighth of June. So I think we we can definitely handle this through committee prior to that. Right. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Nack. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a few more uh, questions. So um, I think it's Deputy Chief Murphy. When when you do provide those numbers, uh, what I was just wondering is there a way to sort of look back to what it was, not just even even last year, but but uh, as far back as 2019, because I was on the um, crime mapping website and and from the looks of things, but I don't know if this includes everything as an example. It looks like there were actually more reported crimes in the downtown in 2019 than there were in 2020, and and you know, there is that some narrative out there that there's, I think we're, we're in a bit of a state of lawlessness and that might convince people to not visit parts of our city, which I think would be really unfortunate. So if we have statistics that suggest otherwise, if that's able to be shared, I think that would be really helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, just a final question, and, and that was uh, back to Councillor Walter's question around the date of the next EAC. I just want to double check, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Corbold. Um, we, we are sort of in the, I mean, this third wave is worse than any other time that we've been in. And I'm just wondering if, if instead of waiting a full month, is it wise to, you know, even look at uh, that week when we would have our council meeting on the 17th and the 19th and set aside an hour and a half that we could schedule if the agenda is not too big to be able to be able to respond. Uh, I just, I, I'm a little worried about waiting a whole month until the next EAC recognizing that we're in a, uh, in a pretty serious time right now. Mr. Chair, I can confirm that the next meeting is on uh, June 8th. Yeah. So what I'm getting, I mean, you know, if that's a wise, wise to wait that long, or if maybe we should look to siphon off a little bit of council time, one of those uh, in two weeks or something, just to be able to respond if needed. We can certainly call a meeting on pretty short notice if we need to, Councillor, but you know, I defer to Council on if they'd like to uh, make that decision now. Yeah, uh, by motion, this committee can establish another meeting at a defined time, um, and but I can also call one on an hour's notice if necessary, if the situation warrants. However, for courtesy purposes, um, um, uh, setting aside time now, roughly in between the two meetings. That's that's a real that is an option for us. Uh, if and, and recognizing we don't have a lot of available time lying around, that's why I just wanted to suggest maybe we should start considering, even if it's the overflow time on the nineteenth. I, I just I feel it sort of sends a, it feels a little odd to me to say, okay, well this EAC meeting is almost done and the next one's not for a month. Meanwhile, we're our numbers have never been higher, and so. Um, recognizing we can call in an hour. I just don't know if it would be wise to sort of set aside time for us in the future, but I guess uh, that, that's something that we can think about and see what the agenda would look like on, on in two weeks time to see if there's a chance to fill that in. Well, it might be useful. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, let's, let's think about that for a little while. And then yeah. uh, at the end of the meeting, if we want to consider a motion around that, we can, but okay. let's, give a, uh, a little bit of time to reflect on that. Absolutely. Okay, so that's it for me for now, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Council Piquet. Yeah, just a simple question. Speaking of eyes on the street, um, I know that we've had far less uh, uh, 311 reports on potholes, and you did indicate potholes in the presentation. So I'm wondering if we're being a little more proactive uh, when folks are out in, on the street uh, doing repairs, that they keep their eyes open for them and uh, they're logging them uh, as well, just staff, city staff, um, because I know we rely on folks reporting through 311 and we're going to miss a lot of stuff uh, because there's just less folks out. Councillor Paquette, uh, Brian Simpson here. The number of notifications to the 311 are definitely down, but also the number of potholes we're doing is up significantly. Uh, we've rejected some energy. Uh, we're no longer doing utility cuts, so we're directing our energy towards the potholes. And uh, I think there's a direct correlation on that because uh, there are a lot of people at home. They are paying attention, and they do let us know fairly quickly. So, All right. Fair enough. Well, that's good. I'm glad that folks are engaged. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, the last issue is um, I, this has probably been covered, but, again, I've been receiving questions about this, and folks just want to know um, if uh, – when it comes to dog parks and things like that, are we uh, are we going to ensure that the grass is uh, low because they're concerned about um, you know parasites and things like that in tall grass, um, kind of bothering their their little pups? Don't 
whoever wants to answer that. Yeah. Count for Piquet. Brian Simpson here. I can get back to you with more specific information, but generally we are following a, a process that we have with the dog parks in the past, so uh, that work will continue. Okay. The, you know, and obviously because of last year, understandable why that question was raised. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe just a couple of questions. So I, I take your point, Mr. Corbold, that uh, our objective with enforcement is compliance, not number of tickets issued. I, I think uh, the more opportunities we have to de-escalate, uh, given the level of tension everyone's facing, um, and just then to verify that you know the normal approach is first to ask nicely, then to ask less nicely, I suppose, more assertively. And then if there's continued resistance, then then we would issue the ticket. And so just because we haven't issued a ticket in a situation doesn't mean we haven't had a hopefully constructive or perhaps firm conversation with someone about the importance of compliance. Is that a fair description of what the uh, escalation process is in our interactions with citizens when we're enforcing things like public health orders or anything else for that matter? Yes, certainly, Your Worship. Our approach has always been to educate first to ensure people are aware of the ever-changing public health measures because, as you know, we've discussed today, there's a lot of dynamic uh, situations, a lot of changes happening. And then ticket, tickets are issued in situations where people are repeatedly ignoring uh, the that initial attempt uh, or orders or where the severity of the situation warrants immediate enforcement and that has happened from time as well so it's definitely an escalation um, and i believe it's being done executed very well and it's the right approach uh, that's being done so and then it's a whole other question which has been raised in recent days about what happens after that i mean the city does have a role to appear uh, if there's um, if the if the ticket is appealed and there's a, a court process uh, we, we have a role um, to substantiate the the basis of the ticket um, but but ultimately it's a it's a prosecutorial process and a court process uh, to actually um, get to the finish line so to speak of the accountability and so my question is I, I know that's not our data necessarily but but do we get reports back on um, whether these fines are being um, are, are sticking essentially? Uh, because there is a perception, right or wrong, out there, uh, and we may not be able to correct it today. But that that at that stage in the process, accountability is falling short. Notwithstanding our best efforts to educate, cajole, ticket, and enforce, are part of the process. Yeah, I would say that uh, it still um, remains to be seen uh, in some of the cases, whether whether that will go to the full extent. We can certainly undertake to have that discussion with the Solicitor General um, and see where we are on uh, and examine the final outcomes of all those ticketing situations. We don't have that now, but we can endeavor to undertake that in the coming weeks. Well, and, and I ask first from the premise of you know, if if convictions or or I, I'm not sure if convictions is the right word in this situation, but if follow through and and completion of the fine process uh, is which I mean, paying the fine amounts to a plea, I suppose. Um, uh, if that is breaking down, I just want to make crystal clear that that's not an error on the city's part. In terms of our approach, you're muted, Mr. Corbalt. Certainly. So our, our main focus is on the compliance, on the education, on the enforcement where required. Uh, once that ticket is issued, it, it is very much up to the solicitor uh, general to you know follow through in terms of if there's a need to in terms of prosecutions. And I'll just see if um, Ms. Jacobson wants to add anything to that for clarity. Thanks, Mr. Cobalt. I can certainly uh, help out with this. And I would I draw a bit of a distinction between tickets issued under our bylaw and tickets issued under the Public Health Act, of course. We have a much more significant role with prosecutions for bylaw offences, whereas the Public Health Act order tickets are prosecuted provincially. Um, as indicated, we can try to get some information on the, uh, the results of a lot of those tickets. Um, but, you know, please do keep in mind that some of them may still be working through the process just because of court delays and things like that. 
Well, yeah, I think if we can um, uh, differentiate between the success of uh, the holding up to the to the scrutiny of the law and the courts of our bylaw and our enforcement of our bylaw as distinct from our best efforts. And, and we appreciate the province delegating the authority to us to uh, to enforce their laws, but to be able to then also distinguish the extent to which uh, their public health laws and orders, which are not guidelines or suggestions, these are rules and laws, as has been said, but the extent to which those are holding up through the uh, through the court process. And I think that would be very important data if we can assemble that. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. Okay, um, uh, I had lots of other questions, uh, all of which have been asked by my thoughtful colleagues here of this distinguished panel of people working very, very hard on our behalf under difficult circumstances. So my thanks to all of you. I'm not seeing any more questions at this time. Uh, so I'll take a motion to receive uh, the report for information. Oh, second. Oh, we don't need to second. Yeah, I think that was Councillor Banga. Uh, yeah. All right. So uh, we can consider the question of schedule in a moment. So let's come back to that. But on receipt of information, please vote. Yes, Mr. Click. Thank you, Councillor Peckett. I mean, yes. yes. My device. Same for Zadik. Thank you, Councillor Zadik. Yes, for Benga. Thank you, Councillor Bainga. Yes, for me as well, I won't take it. Thank you, we have all the votes. Please display the vote. And that is carried. So then just looking at uh, two weeks from now, uh, there are, um, I guess, um, first of all, Mr. Clerk or Mr. Corbold, I um, can't remember if we've done the uh, agenda review committee for the council meeting on the 18th, I don't, 17th, I don't think we have just yet, uh, unless we did the other day and I'm blanking it out, I don't know, but uh, um, uh, likelihood of having spare time that week, either on the 17th or, or perhaps an overflow time on the 19th, should the need arise to, uh, so we could put a hold in calendars at this point might be one approach. Um, or we can also add an item to a council meeting. That's, uh, it doesn't need to be an EAC, uh, strictly speaking, uh, to, to have the same kind of conversation. And particularly if there's advocacy pieces coming out of it further to Council Walter's earlier point. So, uh, just just an agenda intensity check for the week of the 17th. We believe that, that there will be time, Your Worship, uh, with the current agenda we have. Okay, so so we can repurpose time that's in our calendars most likely rather than ask to hold time right now. Um, I'm going to suggest that rather than passing a motion to, because we can't appropriate time from council, but when we are council, we can appropriate time from ourselves. So as committee, we can't usurp council's jurisdiction, but let's just all remember that we have the uh, opportunity and bandwidth to do so uh, in that week. And, um, and we will avail our, ourselves of it if it's a benefit. Is that satisfactory, Councilor Nack? That's excellent, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. You're most welcome. Uh, if there is nothing further, then, um, then please stay safe out there and, um, and get vaccinated. But I heard 130-somethings uh, signed up today to get vaccinated, which is phenomenal. Councillor Knack, there you go. Well done. Monday afternoon, 1 o'clock. <laughs> Clear the next day. It is true what they say about day, the day after. At least it was for me. So. Anyway, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, have a good uh, rest of your day. Uh, some of us have uh, some additional business at 4 o'clock, so we'll see some of you again. But uh, for the rest of you, thank you all for your efforts.